the same way. Uh, Steve, thank you for coming coming for this little interview um, set up. Um, you're welcome. I'm yeah. always happy to give interviews. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, now we did. I did try. Now I've met you before at some other events, and I did try to do an interview like this before at um, York University, but due to noise and storage space, uh, couldn't be done. So this is ideally try and pick up what we did with that. Um, because when I last met you, you did a talk on um, writing in different medias between, you know, webcomic and video gaming. And just for the sake of the listener, what exactly is a game writer entail? What is the job? What exactly do you do in the job? I mean, it does vary quite a bit. I mean, obviously, you know, so the, the, the ideal scenario is that you get called in um, quite early in a project and you get involved with the development of the story and the characters and and how that will impact on the gameplay itself and vice versa. Um, and you work with the design team um, in order to, to do that. Um, but then there are other times when you're just asked to, to um, write the dialogue based on uh, an already existing game or you might um, you might even just be invited to do the script editing on something that's being translated from um, Polish or Russian or something like mm -hmm. this. So, so it does vary quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, so like when you're when a writer is working on on the structure for, you know, so like the the narrative, um, it's quite important to be aware of how the interactivity plays an important part in. Um, the direction the story goes because you know so like you have to accommodate um, the way the player thinks mm -hmm. and deals with um, the the obstacles and, and objectives that the game presents. I was going to say, yeah. I mean, I know in some games, like some people are writers are brought into like you know a game is primarily done, but they just want to say give us a basic outline of how this all fits together. And I just think in your experience, I mean. Have, What's it like working within a team of people as opposed to being, to being brought in as like, you need to do this within a few hour weeks or something like that? Um, it's always difficult when you have a completed project because, you know, sort of it's, it has its own structure. Hmm. Um, so all you're doing is kind of like um, fitting something within that structure. Um, and it's not always very easy. You know, so people expect a writer to, to do fantastic things when they have no input into the way that the character is developed across the, the whole of the game and mm. things like this. Yeah. I mean, all, all that you can do is is do something that, that you know, might sound good, but I mean, it's, it's often it can be a bit superficial. And so you don't get the real depth of story that you would in a, in a film or a TV series because you're, you're you know, so you're working on it too late. Mm. I was just going to ask, like, how does, you know, working in gaming, because it's not in the same way as, like, television novels or even films, where you work in a linear fashion, it's more about, am I right in saying sometimes you end up doing, like, the end bit and the middle bit and the beginning bit in different orders? Well, yes, but you can do that in um, filmmaking. Mm. I mean, if, if, if the, you know, if you only get access to a particular location for filming on a particular day, then you have to record record those scenes on that day, yeah. regardless of where they are in the um, in the story. Yeah, I mean, in terms like, I think with um, Charles said, like, with Broken Sword 1, like, was the ending already thought of, the beginning and ending was thought of, and the middle bit was the hard part? Yes, well, that's often the case with stories, isn't it? You know, so, like, if you don't know, if you don't know where you're going with the ending, then it's difficult to create in the middle, because you don't have... You don't have a kind of compass to to take you on that path, if, as it were. Mm. Um, so, so you know, sort of like often you have an idea for for a scenario with a story. You know, if you um, you know and the characters and stuff like this, and so you kind of come up with a beginning, and you and you sort of like so, well, where is it going? Where is it going to end? You, you don't necessarily have the details, but you want something, you know, sort of like fairly fairly clear you know, in, 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 at least in a basic level. Mm. And then, you know, kind of like, you know that certain certain things will happen um, in order to get to that point. But then you kind of work backwards, particularly with a game, where you put in more and more complications, you know, all the time. So you kind of like saying, you know, in order to get to the finale, 
we uh, we have to set you know set up these three or four things um clues that the the player must put together you know to do that and so you kind of like you work back and put in the detail and and, and you know so like individual puzzles are, are kind of designed backwards in a way mm. because you know sort of like you know where you want to go mm. but it's kind of like how do you put in the complexity of the puzzle mm. in order to make it interesting for the player it's like in broken sword 2 mm. where you have to get over the fence at the docks yeah. there's a there's a dock at the other side of the fence mm. so so the objective obviously here is get over the fence and deal with it or deal with the dog so you can get over the fence mm. so then you kind of like work back from that how do we how do we get rid of the dog well mm. you use the biscuits but how do you get the biscuits and so it kind of like you know so that's how you how you develop so so sometimes it's not it's not the order that you you do things in it's kind of like it's kind of like you know you set up these objectives and you then you work backwards to work out you know the details of the puzzle Okay, all right. Um, I want to. We'll quickly go through some of the stuff you've done. In fact, when you started out, actually, you were an artist. Actually, you weren't a writer to begin with in gaming. Mm -hmm. um, just how did that essentially, as an artist, how's it been? You know, doing that as a job or as doing it as a hobby now. Um. Well, I've always always been interested in drawing and painting, um, and um, certainly when. I joined Revolution Software. I was actually taking an evening course mm. in visual studies, which was like a, a fine arts um, course. Mm -hmm. So you know, sort of like whenever I do things, I always like to take them as seriously as possible. So with with the art, um, I was doing that, which which helps me, you know, sort of like with with some of my st the stuff I did with. With Revolution, mm -hmm. so I mean, you know, sort of like when I joined Revolution, I was doing background paintings and, you know, sort of like um, work on on the screens for um, Beneath Still Sky. Yeah. And then I was doing some sprite animations, and, and that really came about slightly unexpectedly. I mean, you know, sort of I knew somebody who knew that Revolution were looking for an artist, and and I took my portfolio along and. Um, you know, fortunately, they, they liked it. So it was, it, it kind of came from there. And then sort of like, as, as it developed, I, you know, sort of like, I, I just moved into the producer role. And it was, it was, um, it was one of those things that, that Revolution just needed somebody who, who um, could, could keep things organized and, and, and push thing push the, um, development along really, and <laughs> you know, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sometimes that sort of guy. So you know, yeah. Uh, so, so sometimes you upset people by doing so, but <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, it's 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 all done for um, the the good of the project. You know, so like you, I'm you know, sort of like I'm always I'm always convinced that the, you know, sort of like as long as you have the um, the goal of making the best game possible, then, then you know, sort of like everything else is is either contributing to that or working against it. Mm. So you have to kind of like make sure that that everything that's done is is contributing, and that's really where it comes from. Okay, um, like you said, you started as an artist. You also worked in. I think you started as a background artist on Beneath the Still Sky. You also did a bit of animation. I'm kind of curious, how was it like animating in pixels back in those days? I mean, the trend now seems that a lot of indie games want to be pixelated. And I'm just curious, from your experience, how was it like doing it then? And what do you think people have the idea of what it's like now? Well, I think a lot of the so-called pixel games now are not really pixel games because they they use false pixels, don't they? They're, mm. they're, they're larger than, than real pixels. Yeah. Because our, our monitors these days are so um, such a good resolution that you know sort of pixels are really tiny. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they make false pixels. They make these square blocks, and sometimes they're not even consistent. You know, so, sometimes you know sort of like the blockiness is is different on one screen than it is on another, and, and things like this. Yeah. So so they're not really they're not really doing pixel art, <laughs> or, or some of them are. Yeah, yeah. They, they're they're making they're. Make, they're they're creating a stylized look that has a pixelized look to it, mm. which is different. Yeah. So when we were when we were working on Beneath Steel Sky, we had, we were working with a resolution of three twenty by two forty, mm. 
and that's not many pixels, you know, and they look blinking huge on the screen. Mm. Um, you know, but but obviously the monitors are so much smaller, like fourteen and fifteen inch monitors. So yeah. you didn't notice quite as as much as you would now. I mean, if you if you're looking at those same screens on a twenty four inch monitor, I mean, that'd be you know sort of it'd be quite ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Except you know sort of like the thing that we would the things that we were doing was to try and disguise the pixels as much as we could. Yeah. Whereas pixel art now is to try and emphasize the pixels. Yeah, so, so it's jaggedness. kind of a, it's the opposite of what we were trying to do. Yeah. I mean if you look at if you look at the screens for Beneath Steel Sky, they were all painted by hand. Most of them were painted by a guy called Les Pace and I, I did a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Um and then they were scanned in. And then they were touched up so that we, we tried to disguise the pixels <laughs> with, with um, dithering and stuff like this, yeah. and anti-aliasing and such. Mm. Um, and even some, of the, even some of the sprites are actually slightly anti-aliased against the, the background. Yeah. Um, if you look at um, some of the sprites in um, Dr. Beck's surgery and things like this. Mm. Um, but it's, it's all about giving... The, <laughs> When you when you're animating with pixels, you're trying to give the impression of things that that, that aren't necessarily there. Yeah, you want um, to create because, a because you have so yeah. few pixels to work with. Mm. So I mean, you look at Foster's face as a sprite, mm. you know, and and it's just a few coloured blocks, you know, a few coloured pixels. There's no real features there. Mm. You know, his mouth, his nose, his eyes. Mm. Are, you know, don't have proper features, mm. but because of the way that the colours work with each other and the shadow or the appearance of shadow, it, you know, sort of it looks like a face. And, yeah. uh, and the same thing with a lot of a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. It's about you know, if you go back to Doctor Beck's surgery again, yeah, there's a guy lying on the bed, you know, with his with heart his, open. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's sort of like his, his, his midriff is all kind of like pulled back. Yeah, well, like, you do see yeah. like the doctor like trying to pull at his heart, and you see him kind of go, ah, 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 a few yeah. Times. And there's and there's some great. Anim in fact, you know, so if you look at all the animals in that in that room, there's some fabulous animals. Like you know, sort of like when when Foster goes behind the screen and and the doctor examines his his organs. Yeah. There's some great and you know subtle animations of his organs beating and, and mm -hmm. pulsing and stuff like this. Yeah. But my favourite animation in that is a really tiny one. The guy on the bed mm -hmm. is awake. <laughs> yeah, and every, that's so, a... and every so often he will blink. Yeah, I, I noticed that. That was did he ask him? Is but, that guy okay? It's like no, he is. He's fine. He's awake. <laughs> yeah, but you get this sense of motion on his eyes of him blinking, mm. and yet all that's happening is those pixels are changing colour. Mm. They're not actually moving. No, <laughs> and so and so it's kind of it's kind of like how how you use things like colour changing to give the impression of movement. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, and, and the guy who did that, a guy called Steve Oates, is one of the best animators I've ever worked with. <laughs> and he's just, he's, he was just so good yeah. at, you know, doing this. And he was all self-taught. He taught himself on an Amiga. Wow. And he's just brilliant. He was a fantastic animator. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's the really tiny, clever things like that that made all the difference, I think, in, in Steel Sky. Yeah. You know, sort of, and it's, you know, it's guys like, like Steve and, you know, sort of um, guy called Adam Tweed needed some animations. And, and, you know, sort of like the, there's just such, you know, good people to work with. Mm. And then obviously, you know, on the writing side, there was Dave Cummins mm. who who wrote all the dialogue for Benin Steel Sky. Yeah. Not, you know, quite a lot of the dialogue for Broken Sword. Yeah. I mean, uh, too. Yeah. I was actually going to lead up because you started off as, like you said, background artist and anime uh, for mm. Leaves of the Sky. How did you move? How did you become a writer for Revolution for the Broken Soul games and later onwards? Oh, um, almost by accident, really. You know, sort of. Uh, you know, I, was, I started getting involved with the, 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 you know, in story meetings and, you know, sort of like design meetings and things like this be, because I, I was the producer. Mm. And and it just kind of like evolved from there really. And I've always wanted to to write, and and working with, you know, sort of like people who who had talent, mm. and 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 working with Charles who, um, you know, sort of like, isn't a writer as such uh, in, in many respects, mm. but he he's very good at kind of like 
getting people to work towards a goal. You know, you've got an idea for the, for a story. Let's let's work towards making that story as good as possible. Yes. And that's you know, he's like a director of a film. You know, he's kind of like pushing for for the best yeah, well, he's um, possible he can. You know, and and it's not just you know. He, he will. He will not just you know push push the story. He will push the art, and he will push, you know. And that's that's why the art is so good in Broken Sword One because he brought in really strong people, mm. um, you know, so, um, to to lift it beyond what had previously been done in in, in the genre at that time. Yeah, I know. I do remember the stories that the when Virgin when Charles, I suppose we talked to Virgin about this and said they wanted a very big game and you know you ended up hiring a lot of people from Don Bluth's animation, which happened to be an island of all places at that point. So mm -hmm. I get like you said, you know, Broken Sword, you know, at the time I remember seeing it, it really did look like an animated film. <laughs> you know, like a clickable animated film in many ways. Well I think that you know, sort of like the the Don Bluth guys, you know, sort of were able to teach us an awful lot about um, composition and perspective and, and colour and, and and so on. Yeah. So you know, sort of like those those screens were just you know, sort of like incredible to yeah. see. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 even in, even though they're the relatively low resolution, you know, six forty by four eighty, the the actually, I think they still stand up in many respects. Mm. You know, sort of for all of that, mm -hmm. um, and I think I think that um, the people that we worked with um, we just just added so much that that you know you couldn't go back from really, mm. um, and it was just just a pleasure to work with them as well because you know they were just so talented you know so, and I, I learned so much and I think everybody else on the project learned so much <laughs> from from them mm. and I think that 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 is one of the beauties of working with with talented people is that there's always there's always something to learn from them, mm -hmm. um, and and you know that they're you know sort of like they have the experience and skill that that you know sort of like they know what they're doing and it's easy to respect that you know sort of like too often you get people who um, try to pretend they know what they're doing and 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 often it's it ends up being you know a problem because they don't deliver yeah. You know, they, they 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 have all the words, but they don't. You know, they can't back that up with with delivery. Yeah. And so, you know, you get animators who can't really animate, or or artists who can't really draw characters and things yeah. like this. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sort of it's just frustrating because you know, sort of like where you know why do they why are they calling themselves? As a, well, I th wouldn't it be the case of, you know, somebody's particularly good at character animation, but somebody's not good at, like, you know, environmental stuff and vice versa. You try and find those people and bring the strengths up as much as you can. Would you say that was something you wish could happen back then, or did you not really know? Um, well, back on Steel Sky, I mean, you know, sort of like, there was, on, there was only a you know, small number of us, mm. relatively speaking. So, so we had to kind of, like, be able to do a number of different things. Um, and you know, so like when you start getting onto bigger projects like Broken Sword, then obviously skills start to specialize a bit more. Mm. Um, but you know, so at the same time, you know, you still you still have people who can who can do multiple things, and you also, I mean, regardless of of whether you know, sort of you're a character animator or or a background artist. You know, sort of, you should still have some knowledge of, yeah, of, yeah. of other areas yeah. because, because you know, sort of ultimately, um, you know, the ability to draw is is a, a fundamental skill. Whether you're drawing, you know, sort of like a car or whether you're drawing a person, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's that ability to kind of like see the shapes and see 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 the forms exactly, um, yeah. and and be able to transfer them to paper or, or digital media or what have you, you know, sort of however you go about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that that's quite important. It's, you know, sort of like at the end of the day, when you're drawing or painting or, or you know, sort of like whether it's, you know, sort of like physically or on, on a digitally on a, in Photoshop or something like this, yeah. you know, you still got to transfer those forms and shapes, mm -hmm. whether, whether they're human or, or a cabbage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, indeed. So um, I'll, 
Okay, well, let's get on to um, a few key games you worked over the years. Um, uh, the three games I have in mind are, are these. Uh, I want to start off with Broken Sword 2. Now, like I said, the Shadow of the Templars became a big hit and, you know, ended up becoming critical praise both on the PlayStation and the PC as well, which was kind of from rare at that time. But particularly with Broken Sword 2, that you wanted to jump into it. And I think the story goes from Charles is like, you want to do a sequel, but Virgin were a bit iffy about it, and you only did it if you finished it within a year. And considering the fact you also had the little cliffhanger note at the end saying George and Yuko will return in an even greater adventure. Um, just your memories of Broken Sword 2 as a sequel, how did you, looking back at that game, what did you feel about that whole thing? Well, I mean, in, in a sense, you know, sorry, but I mean, Beijing was saying, yes, you've got, you've got to release it within a year. Mm. And that was fair enough, because, I mean, you know, sort of like, it was about trying to, to build on the success of the first one, mm. you know, assuming it was going to be a success. But, but a lot of the kind of like previews and, and, and initial, um, you know, kind of like interviews and stuff like this would suggest that, that we had a winner on our hands. So, so it would have been silly not to do a sequel. Yeah. Um, and in many respects, we started on at least the story and design, well before we finished Broken Sword 1. Hmm. Um, and, and, and so kind of like the two things were really in parallel, finishing one, starting the other. Um, so that by the time we, you know, sort of, by the time we had come to the end of Broken Sword 1, we were ready for the team to move on to Broken Sword 2. Exactly. And the fact that it was very similar and had a lot of, you know, sort of like similar animations and similar style and stuff like this. I mean, did you jump? Um, was helpful. Did you jump like straight on once the game was finished? Did you have like a, maybe a month off and they were straight into two, or was it just like immediately? No, it was pretty much immediately. I mean, the, I mean, people took holidays. I mean, people always take holidays, but you know, sort of like, you know, as far as production goes, it was like straight from one to the other. In fact, you know, sort of like we were well onto it before the. Um, before the release of the first one, because okay. obviously, you know, sort of like in those days, you know, you had manufacturing and stuff like this and, and, and translations of, of text and so mm. on. So there's this period where you pretty much had everything. I mean, there was bug fixing and stuff like this. Yeah. But you we pretty much had everything nailed down. And then it was kind of like, you know, sort of like, you know, testing and, and manufacturing and stuff that had to take place. So there was this kind of like period where, you know, if we didn't have if Broken Sword 2, we, we, we would have been just twiddling thumbs. Yeah. So so it was it was quite important to, to be able to kind of move straight on to that. Yeah. I mean, looking back at it, did you think the game was good as a follow-up? Is there things, what you're proud of, or you felt, hmm, we should have done that better, or we did that better in the second um, It would have been, I think, better if we'd had a larger scope to it, I think. Hmm. You know, like, like it's definitely a smaller game than Broken Sword One, mm. and it would have been nice to kind of like do another game of that size. But you know, we worked to the constraint of of have, you know releasing it in a year, yeah, and and so that kind of like put some some limitations on what we we could and couldn't do. Mm. I think I think I think Broken Sword One is a little more open in the sense that you keep going back to Paris and you and the player needs to work. Out much more what what they should do next. Whereas yeah. Rock so Two, you kind of know where you got to go. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of pretty much from start to finish. Mm, it's more linear in terms of you know you're at this point, the story moves you to this point, the story moves you to this point. Whereas in the first mm. game, you have Paris as a hub, and you can either go to Ireland or Spain and that type of thing. Yeah, and I think that that you know, in some respects, that 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 is its only weakness. I think. Right. I mean, you know, sort of like we improved on the animation. Mm -hmm. I think I think a lot of the backgrounds are much better, bigger. Um, you know, sort of like we 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 tried to push the scope of what we were doing with those those locations a bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of like the, like the big screens that we had at the docks. And, yes. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the huge outdoor screen of of Coromonte and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, we just just. Um, I mean, they were, they, were, they were not only nicely drawn, they, mm. were, they were really nicely coloured and everything. So, I mean, you know, so like we pushed the, we pushed it a little more. Yeah. And, and, and we improved the interface for the PS1 as well mm. on, on the second game. Yeah. So that, you know, a lot of PS1 players felt it was the better game. Yeah. 
Just because of, because of because of that, you know, and and you know, sort of, I think that I think it suited the PS One better as well, mm-hmm. um, because because you were able to kind of like work through it differently. I mean, obviously, you know, a platform like PS One, which is you know very much console game, is, yeah. uh, console platform, is you know, so I think P uh, Broken Sword Two just just suited that much better. Yeah. Um, than than the first one did. Yeah, but that's not to say that that either was bad. It was just I think that that you know it was it was a a better the second one was a better game to play on on the PlayStation One. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, recently with the remastered edition, I think it had outsold the, the director's cut of the first game. I think uh, when it was released, so still got a yeah yeah. So yeah. it's still popular with people. I think that's a good thing. Good yeah, I think so. I think so. I, and um, you know, there was you know, so we worked the um, the bad guy in a bit better as well. Mm-hmm. I think you know, sort of, which is always always good. I mean, that they you didn't really get a proper sense of who the bad guy was. In... <laughs> you knew it was about the Knights Templar, but what was like the central yeah, figure? Yeah. yeah. Whereas in two, it was like you knew it was all building up to Tess like a poker, the Mayan god. Mm, yes, but also we we met. Kazak quite early as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, whereas you know, sort of, we didn't really meet uh, the Grand Master until quite late in the game, really, mm-hmm. for the first time when when George spied on it on him down in the um, the, the secret church. lake, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so so it's a bit, yeah. I, th- I think I, I think there are kind of like ups and downs on each, you know, and. and it's all a learning process, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. I think I think if 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 they were done now, you'd do them very very well, not very differently. Hmm. But I think think you'd make some some changes to certain aspects of the story. Yeah. Like like with the, you know the grandmaster and things like this, make him a much um, stronger character. Yeah. Than himself. Yeah. Um, before we move on, I mean, I might as well ask probably the question you get asked as well as Charles is the name Broken Sword. I mean, now there is one mentioned in the first game, and then there is one in the third game, literally. Um, how did that name come about, really? What, what was why that title? Um, well, the whole mythos of the Broken Sword has a lot of um, you know, sort of like connotations going back through history. Anyway, you know, it's kind of like there's the whole you know, turning swords into plowshares kind of thing. There's all, you know, kind of like the broken sword is, can be kind of like, um, sort of put together as a, as a, as a cross and things like this, you know. So, so the connection, you know, to, to various aspects of history is, is kind of like long gone. And also, you know, kind of like it's a strong um, narrative image as well. Mm. You know, sort of. Um, if you look at um, Lord of the Rings, Tolkien used the idea of the broken sword, mm. um, and then um, roughly the same time as as Lord of the Rings came out, there was a story by Paul Anderson called The Broken Sword, <laughs> um, which which is about you know sort of like his fantasy as well. Um, in fact, when I first got involved with Revolution and somebody mentioned Broken Sword. I said, oh, is that, is that based on the book by Paul Anderson? <laughs> oh, no, no, it's something completely different. <laughs> you know, so, no, what, so could you, you could have said... Of like, you know, it's one of those things that have just been, you know, around. And I, I, I quite like it as a kind of, um, you know, sort of over, overarching kind of title. Yeah. Right? I think it has a lot of implied uh, meaning. Yeah. With you know, and and obviously, I think that there are different um, there are different ways to read things into it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but f- funnily enough, in York, outside the <clears throat> outside the Minster, mm. is a statue of the Emperor um, Constantine. Yes. Yes. And. Um, the sword that he, he has in that statue is a broken sword. <laughs> and, and um, you know, sort of like Tony and I desperately wanted to use that in a game, in a broken sword game. So 
even if it was just a, co- a comedy reference, you know. But yeah. We never, we never able to kind of like set the game in York. I was going to say, you thought of doing a Broken Sword game somehow in York at any point. Well, actually, when we did Broken Sword three, hmm. um, it was about ley lines, hmm. um, or, or at least you know, sort of like ley lines figured quite strongly. Yeah. yeah. Um, hence, you know, why we went to Glastonbury. Hmm. Um, and there's reputedly a big ley line that, that goes through York and, and through the York Minster. Yeah. So we, we desperately wanted to try and set one of the levels or sections in York, um, but we had to make some cuts and it didn't, it didn't sort of like get included. So yeah. <laughs> and Sudden 3 was going to be huge. There were about three sections of the game that we had to actually um, remove because it was, you know, it would have been taken us too long to complete it. Yeah, yeah. But if you actually, if you go up to the top of York Minster <laughs> and look towards the junction of the the ooze and the foss, yeah, um, you can see all these churches in a straight line, <laughs> um, and in a line with the um, with Clifford's Tower, right? As well, and it's really spooky. <laughs> think, oh my God! And 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 they are all all. All on this supposed ley line. It's just like really weird. It's like all uh, surprisingly connected in some yeah. strange way. And but the, the the really weird thing um, is that where where it kind of points to this junction of the two rivers, that little kind of like bit of land between between the junction or the two arms of the junction. Yeah, uh, was once Templar land, <laughs> and it's now called. St. George's Field. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, you know, there's a spooky connection there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, well, was it Douglas Adams who used the joke of 42 and then for most of his life, 42 ended up coming into his life either his home address, <laughs> mails, and all this kind of crazy coincidence. Uh. Yeah. But it's, it's, you know, when, I think it's, it's like, it's like when you buy, it's when you, you buy a new car. And suddenly, everybody on the road seems to be driving the same type of car. <laughs> you notice, you notice it more. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's it's the case of that. You know, sort of like there's always going to be this stuff because because we pulled stuff from from history, mm. and and because York is such a historic town, it's bound to have some sort of connection at some point. Yeah. Um, and I think that that you know, sort of it's but it's just it's just quite spooky when you see these things. <laughs> yeah. Anything? Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. yeah well, <laughs> keep so, so yeah. So um, I, th- I forgot what the original question was. No, no. It was just like I said. I mean, you were talk. I was talking about Broken Sword two, and then you mentioned about the sword, uh, the actual mm. sword oh, <laughs> statue. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. And um, I think again, I recently heard that someone tried to steal it. That was the other. Oh yeah, they did. They, they stole the sword. Yeah, it was found a bit later. Yeah. So. Uh... <laughs> It was uh, some some guy was arrested for doing it. Wasn't yeah, it? so who knows? Maybe if there is to be another Broker's Sword game, maybe you can fit that in there somehow. <laughs> the theft of the sword. The theft of the yeah. sword. Yes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, let's. Uh, the second game I want to talk to you about is just after Broker's Sword Two was um, interesting enough um, a game that Sony came up to you and they sort of suggested, could you do a game which George has a gun, which mm. morphed into the game in Cold Blood, which you had. Yeah. Quite a big, I went on your website, and you had quite a big role in that. You were one of the main guys behind it. So tell us about that game, how it came about, and what you feel about it. Yeah. Well, they wanted a 3D game, hmm. um, did Sony. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or rather, you know, kind of like, isn't it a, full, a proper 3D game? Because mm-hmm. obviously the backgrounds are all pre-rendered. Yeah. Uh, but the characters are 3D. Mm-hmm. So it's like 2.5D as it, it got kind of referred to um but it's a huge game you know if you if you compare it to broken sword one in terms of actual screens mm. it's 10 times as big as broken yeah. sword one mm. there are something like 600 screens i mean a lot of the, you know some of them are kind of like just different angles on the same location yeah yeah um but still i mean it's an awful lot you know particularly when they all have to be you know rendered we saw this, you know, all the computers were linked on the night to um, act as a render file. Yeah. Um, because because the models were just huge mm-hmm. for the time. Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, you would never be able to kind of like play, <laughs> you know, sort of like uh, real time. 
No. Because the models are so huge. But but the guys doing these location models were incredibly talented and very, you know, great, some great work being done. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you consider the number of, of you know, camera renders, mm. I mean, that's just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it wasn't, and because of the nature of, you know, being pre-rendered 3D, we had to kind of like put a lot of, you know, um, 3D markup, which yeah. then got translated into the 2D. So, so the characters knew where to to walk, you know, without appearing to walk through things. Yeah, without know. the collision um, detection. So it was a lot. It was a lot of work, you know. And you know, the, the, there was a lot of people working on on those locations, and a lot of people doing textures, and some people doing the 3D characters and animating the characters. Yeah, and, yeah. So it was, it was quite, you know, a lot, a lot of work. Yeah. I, I actually have played through the game uh, not too long ago, and I do find it funny looking at particularly some of the CG renders cutscenes. I do think, like, you could do that now with today's technology than back then, which I guess you had to really struggle to keep the machine not blowing up with all this, I guess, info of it at the time. Yeah, well, the, the I mean, it's all pre-rendered, the, yeah, the yeah. sequences. So, I, I mean, mean the just, characters... It just plays, yeah. Yeah. just plays as a, a movie, you know, so... Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, some of, some of the models are a bit plastic looking. You know, the <laughs> so on. Yeah. Um, but the cinematics, are, I think, are really strong. Yeah. And that, that's because we worked with people who um, had a, a experience in film. Mm. You know, they did, they did, you know, kind of like special effect work and, you know, cinematography and stuff for, yeah. for film. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, I mean, one of my favourite ones is, is where... John Cord boards the land train. Ah. And, you know, sort of like he's looking through his binoculars and he sees this thing come over the over the hill and you know, sort of like he has to kind of like clamber on board with a grappling hook type thing and yeah, you know yeah. and and you know, it just I just like the epicness that that, that comes across with yeah. with, with what's going on there. Yeah. I think the game was described, I think some of you as it was well the sort of the basic info was like it was a through our it was like a thriller noir type game, mm. which I think some people also said it played very similar to like Resident Evil. I don't know whether that was on the forefront of your mind when you were making it, whether it's like, oh, this is a bit similar to that game, but we just want to do our own thing. Um, we certainly, you know, kind of like we're aware of things. I mean, Resident Evil, perhaps there's sort of like some similarities mm. there. Maybe a little, you know, similar with, um, oh God, I forgot what. Oh, God, I've forgotten the title of it. But there, there, there were a few, you know, kind of like at the time we were, that were doing um, 3D characters on, on pre-rendered backgrounds. I was going to say Alone in the Dark. Was that something mm -hmm. you were going to say? Yeah, yeah, Alone in the Dark. There was a, there was a, a Japanese one. What was it called? Had a female lead Clock character. Tower? No, no. Mm -hmm. Anyway, never mind. That's all right. But, but you know, sort of like... So, so you're kind of like um, shooting in, 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 you know, sort of like within these pre-rendered locations. Mm. But um, yeah, it, it, I think it it worked very well, and I, I certainly think it was the best looking um, PS One game of its time. All right, um, but that, but obviously, <laughs> that's me being biased. That's, that's, that's all right. You can be biased all you want. <laughs> but you know, sort of like. But that's that's due to the you know the talented guys working on the locations and mm -hmm. the character animation you know animators and, and things like this yeah. I, it, you know stuff that that I didn't have direct con direct work with you know? right I was going to say because you did have a pretty big role in this I mean did you feel this was more of a game you helped yourself make more with the team or I'm just curious as like do you feel that's more of a well, project if you, your hands on really yeah well. You know, because I was producer and I was all, I also did a lot of the, the design work and, and, and writing and, and so on. Mm. You know, obviously, you know, sort of, I, I quite a big hand in that. But I mean, I was part of all the, all the design and story meetings. So, you know, then I was actually doing some of the writing of the dialogue and, and, and such. And you just kind of like, I didn't really feel as though it was my game. No, no. I mean, it, it, you know, it was certainly... It was Revolution's game. Yes. Yeah. But I wanted to do the best I could within that framework, as I'm sure that all the others did as well. And so, you know, sort of like, 
you know, I, I certainly didn't want to, you know, do all this work just because um, I wanted, you know, sort of like the accolade. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, um, and it's certainly a team effort. I mean, there are a oh, number yeah. of us worked on that. Yeah. Um, you know, the story and the dialogue and everything. So it's just a case of, you know, this is, this is the, you know, the job that I did. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, that, so. no, no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. That's a fair enough assumption. Um, I'll quickly go through sort of what happened in Revolution. Like you said, you won Broken Soul 3, which was a very big game. And then because it being so big, it meant that, unfortunately, you guys, a lot of you guys were, have to be left off because it was such a big, intensive project. And you, of course, went on to do... Surprisingly enough, you went on to still do writing adventure games throughout a period where most people considered that was dead. You know, the mid-2000s, that was the dead period. Ah, it's only, only dead if you, if you take notice of the wrong, the yeah. wrong media. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that, you know, the gaming at the time also said, like, oh, PC is a dead thing. It's all about the consoles. Mm -hmm. That's the future. So you never know. Yeah, uh, the, tri the trouble is that... The the publishers believed a lot of that nonsense. Yeah. Um, and the publisher models were rubbish, mm. you know, and, and they were just controlling so much and, you know, sort of, and, you know, I mean, in all fairness as well, you know, I mean, when we were, when we finished Broken Sword 3, mm. I mean, Revolution went on for a, a while after that. Yeah, yeah. Because we had another couple of projects trying to get off the ground. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, we didn't, you know, Revolution didn't end with oh no 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 with um Brooks so three mm. but the trouble was you know kind of like these other projects just didn't get the support from the publishers mm -hmm. and ultimately you know because of because of the publishing model at the time you know you, you suffer if you don't get if you didn't get that mm. i mean nowadays you can you can reduce the size of your team and go right well, screw the publishers we'll we'll do it on our own which is what obviously Revolution did with Broke Sold 5. Yeah. They, they effectively said, we're going to do this without the publishers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and, and they laid the groundwork with that by the release of, you know, the director's cut and, and Beneath Steel Sky on, on the iPhone and yeah. things like this, you know. Yeah, so yeah. so it, they knew that the market was still there for, for these games, you know, adventures. And I think that, that you know, sort of like, you should never kind of like discount anything. No, no. I mean, again, comparing this to like, you know, you compare the to rational games, the makers of the Bioshock and, the, you know, after Infinite being such a big thing, they pretty much announced we're pretty much shutting down a rush or we're going smaller now because we can't do something that big and mm -hmm. they seem to be gone. Whereas Revolution, surprisingly enough, you've gone on for about 25 years now. You've just celebrated the 25th anniversary. Well, they have. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not with, I'm not with Revolution, so... No, no, well, you were part of it anyway, so... <laughs> say I mean, I've, I've obviously done work with Charles um, mm. over the years since since I left, but um, I don't regard myself as, as being with Revolution. All right, okay, then. You know, because, because you know, sort of like, they are a company who employs people. Mm. <clears throat> or, or maybe, you know, and I've only ever... Since, since I left, I've only ever done contract work for them. Yeah. So it's... It's not like it's, you know, I'm part of their, you know. I mean, you know, sort of, I had 11 years with them, which I thoroughly enjoyed and, yeah. and felt honoured to be a part of. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, sort of like, <laughs> you know, I wasn't, I wasn't one of the original directors or founders. No, or no, but like you, so yeah. It's just, yeah. you know, sort of, it's still, you know, their company. Yeah. You know. But they still bring you up in like conversations. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> oh yeah, well they, they couldn't have done anything with, without me. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, where would we be without <laughs> Steve? <laughs> no, I mean Charles is very good, yeah. and and the others are very good, um, and you know sort of the the very they say some very kind things about me at times, which I, I'm very appreciative of. But um, you know I wouldn't be where I am today without Revolution. Yeah, exactly. So. I want to draw this to a close with the third yeah. game you've recently worked on, which has got quite a surprising accolade, a game called The Bunker, which yeah, is... Fantastic. Yeah, it is. I mean, <laughs> it is I mean, you can praise the hell out of it if you want. Um, which, the best way I describe it, it's like people who remember FMV games in like the mid-90s, I think, I don't even know from your side, was that ever considered to be the future of gaming, or did you just see that? No, as like, I hated them. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
No, in, in the 90s, when, when those FMV games were out, I mean, you know, so it was so difficult to to get any decent quality mm. on FMV because, you know, kind of like um, hard drives weren't fast enough. How uh, to compress de- de- everything. De- yeah, decompressing the, the video wasn't fast enough and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, um, we started getting some good stuff from Bink, Mm. And oh god, but anyway, you know, so like they had some pretty good code, and so so things were improving. But FMV had, had already kind of like passed by, by pretty much by the time that, that Bink was was doing its good stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and you know, sort of like it wasn't just it wasn't just the fact that that the tech the technology was struggling. Mm. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of them were just using such rubbish acting and stories or <laughs> yeah uh, night so trap. cheesy yeah you know? whereas whereas you take something like the bunker and the guy behind it has a history um in film mm. and so you know kind of he brought a number of, of us in who had experience in games there was me there was kevin beamers and ian thomas mm-hmm. um and we worked with alan um to to kind of like you know sort of like suggest how how you know the game might might work with with the live action and so on mm. and so he knew how to film it he knew how to make the most of those locations he knew how to make the most of the actors and all this kind of stuff mm-hmm. and we knew how to make it interactive yeah and so the kind of like the two the two things came together and I think it's brilliant it's it's, it's maybe a little kind of like thin on the gameplay and i think that maybe future games could you know if if splendid do further ones along that line yeah yeah then then you know they could beef up the the gameplay a little yeah um but having said that you know it's a great experience Mm. and i think that that it's kind of like you know sort of like without that being made people can't say you know realize what what the possibilities are yeah see the potential so so although it could be better in gameplay terms Mm. You know, emotionally, it's powerful. Mm. It's filmed properly. We've got the technology to be able to deliver that that quality of, of playback and, and, and things like this. Mm. We, you know, sort of like um, the bunker was was a genuine location. So yeah. you know, you didn't have to kind of like create any sets. See yeah. that another thing about some of the FMV titles was that this, this stuck a couple of guys against you know computer generated background yeah green screen blue screen type yeah stuff. you know and and unless your you know your 3d backgrounds are absolutely brilliant they will always look wrong yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean nowadays we have the technology to do that yeah but back in the 90s we didn't you see yeah. um so so it's kind of you know so like so so you get somebody who's a good actor like like adam brown there and, and the other actors who had you know, obviously smaller roles, but mm. um, it's just you know you just have so much potential, mm. you know. So you don't have to worry about motion capture or facial capture and and spending weeks and weeks modelling a you know, character in detail. Yeah. You just can't like, get a camera and point it at this this guy who's just gone in makeup and you know he's kind of like got the grime and the sweat on his face. Yeah, and yeah. Who, who genuinely looks terrified when he's at the top of a flight of stairs and stuff like this, yeah. it's, it, you know, and it's just so much easier. Yeah. I because, think... you know, so like we relate to humans more instantly than we do, you know, kind of like a, a, a CGI character. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm kind of curious, how did you get involved in this project? Was this something that came to you, you came to it, and you worked with some other writers? How did this all start in the first place with your involvement? Um... I was contacted by Alan Plunderlife, who who is is the kind of director of the project. Uh, it's his kind of baby. Yeah. Um, he's he's part of Splendid Games, and um, I'm not sure how he he discovered me. I forget now. Mm-hmm. But he contacted me and just said, you know, sort of like we're doing this. Um, would you be interested in talking about it? So we had a chat on Skype and. Um, and then I went down there to to meet with them and thrash some things out and have a look around the bunker itself and, and so on. And it's just it's just fantastic. Yeah. And and we spent all you know we, we sort of like went around the world for one day. Spent the next day 
um, <clears throat> in in this uh, hotel, um, like cafe, <laughs> 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 just just striking out ideas, yeah. and um, yeah, I went for that, and then when I did some more work from home. All right, uh, and it was good. All right, good. <laughs> yeah, well, like like I said, that was the final thing I want to ask. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, hang on, just go. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for this. It's been a really enjoyable t chat with you, and I hope you've enjoyed it as as well. Yes, it was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll end off with this. Um, now, some people like to just joke around that Dan Brown may or may have not have ever been influenced by Broken Sword. I'm just curious <laughs> from your point of view. Do you? I mean, would you? Do you believe it, or do you just think, eh, it's coincidence? Um, I must admit that, I, I mean, I read um, The Da Vinci Code, mm. and it did strike me that, that the two main characters had a very George and Nico feel yeah. to them. American man, uh, French woman. Yeah, but also, you know, sort of, I don't know, there was just one or two things that they said you know, in the book that... that I thought, oh God, he, he's played Broken Sword, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's nothing more than that, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It wasn't that they were, you know, he was quoting it or anything like that. It just, it just felt, you know, the dynamic just felt as though, you know, it, he'd he'd been influenced by playing Broken yeah. Sword. Although I and think I don't know whether he has or not, or whether whether that's just a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, I certainly felt that. Yeah. Well, we can um, safely say Nicole is not the descendant of Jesus Christ. We can at least say that. <laughs> so. Oh, I don't know. You know, sort of. Um, you know, sort of. Who knows what Charles has in his? Head. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know, right? Yeah. 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 No. All right. Well, like I said, thank you so much for this uh, time, and uh, good luck to you in the future, or what else you do, and uh, <laughs> you know. Thank you. Thank you.